Hi guys, just to let you know that I have a promo of another podcast that I would love for you to listen to playing at the very end of this episode. So please stay tuned until then. This episode is brought to you in part by Away Travel. Quite simply, Away makes everything you need for a trip away. Away started with the perfect suitcase, then built from there, creating a range of travel standards developed from the travel stories of friends and seatmates. The pieces aren't smart, they're thoughtful, with features that solve real travel problems. To give the whole world access to better travel standards, Away took the direct-to-customer approach to lower prices and the quality is guaranteed. Your Away suitcase will be with you for life. We are teaming up with Away and Podgo to give you the best deal on premium luggage by going to podgo.co forward slash away. That's podgo.co forward slash away. Away Travel, here to make your journey seamless. Warning, this episode contains description that some listeners may find distressing, so listener discretion is strongly advised. Hi m ms welcome back to another episode of Murder and More. As always, I am your host, Kira. Nature versus nurture is a long-standing debate in the world of psychology that discusses the extent to which certain aspects of our behaviour are either inherited via genetics or the influence of external factors. Approaches vary, with the biological approach focusing on genetics and hormones to explain behaviour, and behaviourism suggesting that all behaviour is learned via conditioning from the surrounding environment. In more recent years, psychologists have become interested in how genetics and external influences interact with each other to shape our behaviour, rather than seeing them as two separate entities. It seems likely that our behaviour is a result of both genetics inherited from our parents and learned behaviours from our environment. Joe Geeling was an 11-year-old boy from Bury, Greater Manchester, where he lived with his parents, Tom and Gwen Geeling. He suffered from cystic fibrosis, a genetic condition that causes thick mucus to build up in the respiratory system, which leads to the lungs and digestive system becoming increasingly damaged over time. Joe was described by friends and family as a bright, fun, popular boy who had a keen interest in dirt biking and supported Manchester City Football Club. His parents went on to describe him as, quote, a very brave and kind-hearted lad, end quote, who was smart, witty and loving, and whom they were extremely proud of. A friend of Joe's, Kim Corbett, told Joe Frost for the documentary Britain's Killer Kids, quote, He was one of those people that you meet that were just so genuine. You know when you meet someone and you think, that's so lovely. He was so funny, he was such a character, and he always made people laugh. He was really popular at school as well, he had a lot of friends. He was hilarious, he was really nice. He always wanted to make everyone giggle. He was just an 11 year old kid. Just silly. Just daft. End quote. Wednesday the 1st of March 2006 was a fairly cold but mainly sunny day. As normal, Joe had attended St Gabriel's Roman Catholic School where he'd made friends with an older student called Michael Hamer. Michael, who was 14 years old at the time, was described as being a loner that started in infancy after his dad left the family before he was born. 
He also didn't have a stable relationship with his mum, causing attachment issues, with criminologist Dr Elizabeth Yardley stating, quote, His dad's abandoned him, so we've got essentially an attachment issue here. He's not forming those attachments with his caregiver. So the relationships that we have with our mums and dads are really important for shaping our relationships that we go on to have with other people. And while we've got a problem with that, that can lead to trouble down the line, end quote. Michael struggled at school, and when he attended secondary school, he became the target of bullies, who picked on him, would call him names, and steal his lunch money. Michael had no friends, at least any of his own age. He hung around with children younger than him, which Elizabeth Yardley suggests is a result of Michael's low IQ, social ineptitude and developmental delay, saying he may have found it easier surrounding himself with younger children who were on the same developmental level as him. Elizabeth Yardley also believes that Michael developed an obsession with Joe, who he admired, but also believes that Joe's popularity and outgoing personality would have amplified Michael's own sense of shame and made him feel worse about himself. She also believes that Michael targeted Joe and wanted to get him alone, which led to a plot with heartbreaking consequences. At lunchtime on the 1st of March, Michael gave Joe a note, supposedly from their head teacher, informing Joe that he had to go home with Michael after school and that his mum would collect him from Michael's at about half past four. The note read, quote, Joseph, you may have heard Year 10s have started to mentor Year 7s, and they've been told to take some books to understand the difficulties some people may be having. As you may know, Michael is your mentor, and will start next week. Unfortunately, Michael has got some of your books, but will be unable to return them to you for two months, due to surgery. So I have spoken to your mum and told her the situation, and I have asked her if you could go with Michael to his house and collect them, with the permission of your mother. End quote. A teacher overheard Joe discussing this note with some of his friends and asked to read it. She realised this note was not in fact from the head teacher and asked Joe to go to the deputy head's office and informed him that he should go straight home and not with Michael. Somehow, Michael managed to coax Joe away from the deputy head's office and a teacher witnessed the pair walking along a corridor where Michael seemed shifty. As the teacher went to interrogate the pair about where they were going, the fire alarm went off and the school was evacuated. After determining that the fire alarm was just a false alarm, school ended at ten past four and Michael began to head for home, with Joe being witnessed walking a few paces behind him. When Joe hadn't returned home, by about twenty past five, his parents grew concerned and reported him missing to the police at 5.24pm. With Joe being young and vulnerable, an extensive search started immediately across Bury, which included four police dogs, family members, and many neighbours searching the town. As night fell and the temperature dipped, Manchester Fire and Rescue Service and firefighters became involved in the desperate search for Joe. At 3am, the search was stepped down, in order for the searchers to get some rest, before being picked back up the next morning. At Joe's school, a picture of Joe was going around, with pupils being asked if they'd seen him. Kim Corbett waited to speak with the head teacher, having known Joe from walking home with him. Next to her was Michael Hamer, who informed her he had seen Joe that afternoon. Kim recalls that he seemed cold, detached and emotionless. The search resumed that morning, however, it wasn't long before it was stopped, after a police dog searching Whitehead Park discovered the body of Joe Geeling. Today's episode is sponsored, in part, by Podcorn. Podcorn is one of the easiest ways to monetize your podcast, whether you're big or small. Podcorn is a marketplace connecting podcasters with amazing sponsorship opportunities 
such as host read ads, interview segments, topical discussions and more. With Podcorn, there is no middleman and you retain full creative freedom. You set your own rates and collaborate with brands directly with no exclusivities. I love Podcorn and I can guarantee that you will too. Sign up today at podcorn.com to begin monetizing your podcast. That's podcorn.com, P-O-D-C-O-R-N.com. Michael Hamer very quickly became the first and primary suspect, and an hour after Joe's body was found, dumped in a wooded gully covered by twigs and leaves, Michael was taken to the police station to be questioned. During questioning, Michael remained calm and denied any involvement in Joe's murder. However, 12 hours after Joe's body was found, at roughly 10.30pm, Michael gave in and confessed to the murder. At about quarter past four that fateful afternoon, the pair arrived at Michael's house. It's believed that Michael made a sexual pass at Joe, who rejected him and possibly threatened to tell other kids at school the next day. As a result, Michael grabbed a frying pan from the kitchen and hit Joe over the head with it multiple times, which left him with multiple bruises to the head and a fractured eye socket. He then got a kitchen knife and stabbed Joe 16 times. It's believed that by half past four, Joe Geeling was dead. Calmly, Michael dragged Joe's body down the stairs, placed it in a wheelie bin, before dragging it out of the house and towards Whitehead Park, half a mile from his house, where he eventually dumped the body. He then returned to the scene of the crime, where Joe's blood saturated the carpet in his bedroom and on the stairs. He set about cleaning it all up, knowing he had 90 minutes before his mum returned from work. When she got home, she noticed red stains on the carpet, however Michael explained them away as a leaking red pen before having a bath and finishing his homework, as if nothing had happened. Detective Superintendent Martin Bottomley, who was in charge of the investigation, stated that Michael's demeanour throughout as the most chilling aspect of the murder. Quote, He acted in a perfectly rational way. He placed Joe into a wheelie bin within minutes of killing him. He walked him through the streets of Berry. He took mobile phone calls from his mum while he was wheeling him through the streets of Berry, acting as if nothing was out of the ordinary. He then went back to the house. He then cleaned up. He then did his homework. He then went to school the next day as normal, and when questioned about the acts and the sightings during the course of the morning, just shrugged and lied his way through them, end quote. During a search of Michael's bedroom, police found a letter on top of his wardrobe that detailed his desire to have sexual relations with Joe, despite him denying the sexual element to Joe's murder. DS Martin Bottomley said of Michael, quote, He said in interview that anyone could have been his victim, but my view is that he'd selected Joe. He has singled him out because of his illness, because he was young, because he was small and weak and not as heavy as him, end quote. As the community reeled from this horrific murder, Joe's body remained in the wooded gully for two more nights to allow forensic teams to collect forensic evidence. On Saturday the 4th of March, Michael Hamer was charged with the murder of Joe Geeling. During the preparation for his hearing, psychologists deemed Michael to be an unintelligent, isolated teenager who had difficulty relating to others and diagnosed him with an adjustment disorder. On Friday the 31st of March, Joe Geeling was laid to rest, with the whole of Barry united in grief. His small coffin was taken to his school where all the pupils lined up to say their final goodbyes and let off balloons in his memory. On Monday the 16th of October, Michael Hamer's trial began at Manchester Crown Court, where he pleaded guilty to the murder of Joe Geeling. Mitigating was David Steer QC, 
who told the court that Michael had killed Joe after an adolescent sexual approach was rejected. Quote, He made a sexual advance towards Joe, who responded to him as gay, and threatened to tell others about what he had tried to do. He then tragically responded in the way he did. End quote. Describing Michael as a maladapted teen who felt isolated and rejected, Mr. Steer went on to tell the court, quote, This previous background to the commission of the offence leads both psychologists to conclude he was a young man suffering from an abnormality of mind in the form of an adjustment disorder. End quote. Michael was subsequently sentenced to 12 years in prison. Alistair Webster, QC for the prosecution, felt the sentence was too light and the case was sent to the Court of Appeal. On the 15th of February 2007, judges at the Court of Appeal agreed with this judgment, increasing Michael's minimum term to 15 years, citing the planning put into the murder, Joe's vulnerability, the violence and detached demeanour in which Michael got rid of his body as aggravating factors that determined their decision. He was sent to Castington Young Offenders Institution in Northumberland, a high security unit that houses the most dangerous of teenagers until they are old enough to be transferred to an adult prison. In December 2016, Michael applied for an early release. However, the Court of Appeal denied his application on the basis that, while he has clearly made significant progress in prison, he was assessed as still being a high risk to children and the public. Michael's next chance of parole is coming up in March 2021. Joe Geeling was a bright, vibrant young boy who had his whole life ahead of him. His zest for life, despite a chronic and debilitating illness, shone through and allowed him to be the popular, funny person he was. In a victim impact statement read out by Alistair Webster QC in court, Tom Geeling said, Quote, we cannot make any sense whatsoever out of Hamer's actions. We feel he will leave us never knowing the truth about the many gaps in his version of events. This we find extremely difficult to come to terms with. Our son meant everything to us. We spent many happy years grooming him into the smart, witty, loving young man that he had already started to become. In spite of the drawback of being born into this world with cystic fibrosis and enduring more than his fair share of hospital visits, we had managed to instill in him a no-self-pity attitude. He understood those were the cards God had dealt to him, and together we made the best of what we had. He was indeed a very brave and kind-hearted little lad. We just pray to God that as the years pass, the pain may ease and the happy memories return, end quote. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to head over to Apple Podcasts to leave a rating and review and Patreon to consider becoming a patron of Murder and More. As a patron, for just for just $2 a month, you get access to episodes early and ad-free, and you get a sticker sent to you. The link to my Patreon can be found in my show notes. To interact with us, you can follow us on Twitter and Tumblr at Murder and More, Instagram at Murder and More Pod, and Facebook at Murder and More Podcast. To view the sources and pictures for this episode, head over to www.murderandmorepodcast.wordpress.com. Have an amazing few weeks, stay safe, and I'll see you all in two weeks for another episode. They murdered her, a vile and disgraceful act. 
we were able to discover the remains of two humans. Welcome to Crime Lapse. I am Eileen. And I'm Charlie. Crime Lapse is a true crime podcast that uses primary audio, in-depth research and emotive narration to give you an immersive insight into the darkest tales and most horrifying crimes. Find Crime Lapse wherever you listen to podcasts and at Crime Lapse Podcast or at Crime Lapse Pod on social media. Everyone has a story to tell, so why not let us tell you some? <laughs>